order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Helen Waitley. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, later today, this House will have an opportunity to pay tribute to the Clerk of the House, Sir David Natsler. May I, may I take this opportunity to add my own? Sir David has served this House for over 40 years with dedication and tireless devotion. His support and advice on parliamentary procedure and business has been invaluable. And I know that members from all sides of the House who want to join me in thanking him for his service and in wishing him the very best for the future. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Ellen Waitley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I also pay tribute to the work of the Clerk of the House? In January, a mother of a three-year-old girl was convicted of female genital mutilation our first FGM conviction, but a chilling reminder that young girls are still being cut, not just in Africa and around the world, but also here in the UK. Will my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, make government time to progress my hon. Friend, the Member for Richmond Park's bill to protect more girls from this abhorrent practice? My honourable friend is absolutely right to raise the issue of this abhorrent practice, to recognise the importance of that first um, prosecution that took place on female genital mutilation here in the UK. It's only right that we find time for this bill, and the government will provide time to deliver it. We've strengthened the law on FGM. That leading to that first conviction, we are helping communities around the world to end this appalling crime. Uh, but it is important that we give time to this bill and act further to ensure that we end what is an absolutely abhorrent crime that scars young girls for the rest of their lives, both physically and mentally. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am sure the Prime Minister and the whole House will join me in sending our deepest sympathies to the friends and family of the cadet who died at Sandhurst last week. I am sure the MOD is supporting the family and fellow cadets at a difficult time, but I also hope they will be reviewing the mental health support they give to all members of the armed forces at all times. Mr Speaker, we also mourn the loss of Gordon Banks and send our condolences to his friends and family and the entire football community. He was one of the greatest goalkeepers of all time, 73 caps for England, including playing in every single game during the victorious 1966 World Cup campaign, which I remember with joy. (laughs) Mr Speaker, I also want to thank Sir David Napley for his work as clerk to the House and wish him well in his retirement. He's been here even longer than I have and uh, has always been a source of a source of advice to all members, irrespective of their party, and I always admire his dry wit and humour whilst describing the proceedings of the House. I think we owe him a big debt of gratitude. Mr Speaker, the Government's handling of Brexit has been costly, shambolic and deliberately evasive. Nothing symbolises that more than the fiasco of seaborne freight. A company with no ships and no trading history. On the 8th of January, the Transport Secretary told the House, we are confident the firm will deliver the service. What went wrong? (laughs) First of all, can I I join the Right Honourable Gentleman in the remarks he made about the cadet uh, at Sandhurst? He referenced the issue of mental health. This is an important issue overall, but obviously an important issue in our uh, armed forces as well. And uh, I'd like to pay tribute to the work of my hon. Friend, the member for Plymouth Moor View, for the work that he has done in relation to mental health in the armed forces. I'd also like to uh, send my deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Gordon Banks. Like the right hon. Gentleman, I'm old enough to remember the 1966 World Cup. Now, let's 
be honest in this House. I think that's important. Um, but from, from being part of that team to, to, I think, something else that people remember, the astonishing Pelé save in 1970, he was regarded as one of the world's greatest goalkeepers. But I also know that he did a lot of community work uh, in the lo- his local area as well. And I know members from all sides of the House would like to join me in paying tribute to him. Uh, as regards the freight capacity, the Government let three contracts. 90% of that was let to DFDS and Brittany Ferries. Uh, those contracts remain in place and that capacity has been, uh, has been obtained. Uh, and uh, due, diligence was covered, due diligence was carried out on all of these uh, contracts. And as the, Depar- as the Secretary of State for Transport made clear in this House earlier this week, we will continue to ensure that we provide that capacity which is important in a no-deal situation, and we will ensure the capacity is there. Mr Speaker, the Transport Secretary told the House that this decision to award a contract to Seaborne Freight had no cost to the taxpayer. This week, the National Audit Office found that £800,000 had been spent on external consultants to assess the bid. Will the Prime Minister use this opportunity to correct the record? To the right honourable gentleman, he's a bit late to the uh, late to the party on this because I was asked this question yesterday in the uh, statement I think from the SNP benches in the uh, so Labour following the SNP. Well, whatever next. Uh, can I can I say to the right honourable gentleman that of course, as I've just said, when these contracts were all let, proper due diligence was carried out. That included that that. That included, that included a third party assessment of the companies that were bidding for the contracts. Uh, there would have been a cost attached to this process regardless of who the contracts were entered into with. Jeremy Corbyn! I'm really impressed that the Prime Minister can keep a straight face while she said due diligence was carried out. The Transport Secretary said its business and operational plans were assessed for the Department by external advisers. On the basis of that advice to his own department, Seabourne was a start-up company with no ships and the contract was high risk, is what he was told. Why then, if he was told it was high risk, did he proceed with the contract? Gentlemen, what he appears to be suggesting is that the government should never look at start-up companies, should never look at the opportunities for new companies to be undertaking these here. But it is entirely right, it is entirely right that the government has ensured that the majority of these contracts went the majority of these contracts went to established companies. Uh, and I think it is entirely right that a company that of which, of which due diligence had been carried out. It's no good saying it wasn't, because it was. Uh, and uh, we will ensure that the ferry capacity is there. What we're doing, of course, what we're doing in these contracts is ensuring that we are able to deal with the situation were we to enter into no deal. Now, the right honourable gentleman has said in the past that he didn't actually want any money being spent on no deal preparations. Uh, he's also said in the past that he doesn't want us to go into a no deal situation. That's fine. But if he doesn't want us to be in a no-deal situation, he's going to have to vote for the deal. It appears that uh, we have to be fair to those advisers because they were instructed to restrict their due diligence to the face value of the presentation put to them by Seaborne Freight, a company that had no trading history, and uh, look into the directors of Seaborne, some of whom, it appears, would not have passed a due diligence test. However, the Transport Secretary told the House This procurement was done properly in a way that conforms with government rules. But what a Freedom of Information request reveals is that the Secretary of State bypassed those rules as the Procurement Assurance Board, a senior panel of experts and lawyers, were denied the chance to scrutinise the deal. So what action is the Prime Minister going to take over what appears to be a very clear breach of those rules? The contract was awarded following commercial, technical and financial assurance at a level in line with the company's status as a new entrant to the market. 
carried out not only by senior DFT officials, but by third party organisations with experience and expertise in this area. That includes Deloitte, Matt McDon- Mott McDonald, and Slaughter and May. It was designed in recognition of the risks posed. No money has been, was paid to the, uh, to the contractor. No money would be paid until, the, uh, until services were delivered. Uh, and therefore, the money has been paid to that contractor. But I say to the right honourable gentleman, he has stood here time and time again and said actually that we shouldn't be doing anything to prepare for no deal. It is entirely right and proper that this government is taking the action necessary to ensure that should we sit, uh, it's not our policy to have a no deal, it is our policy to get a deal. But should we be in that no deal situation, we need to ensure we have the capacity we need, and that's exactly what we're doing. Jeremy Corbyn! Could I bring the Prime Minister back to the question of seaborne ferries? Eurotunnel. Eurotunnel has called this ferry contract procurement secretive and flawed, a secretive and flawed exercise, and taxpayers now face a legal bill of nearly one million pounds contesting that. The money goes up and up. The Secretary of State's decision to award the contract to Seabourn has increased the budget deficit of Thanet Council, the owners of Ramsgate Port, by nearly two million pounds. When questioned on this by the member for South Thanet, the Transport Secretary refused to give a guarantee. Can the Prime Minister today give a cast-iron commitment to the people of Thanet that, and confirm they won't be picking up the bill for this failure of this contract? Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that the Department of Transport and other parts of government are in discussion with Thanet Council about the, uh, the issue of this contract and the impact of this uh, and the impact of this contract. But can I also just again remind the Right Honourable Gentleman of why it is that the Department of Transport has taken these actions in relation to ferry capacity? It is in order to be able to ensure that in a no deal situation we are able to uh, guarantee that medicines will be medicines will be brought into this country primarily. We're prioritising medicines being brought into this country. Again, that was a question I seem to remember being asked on more than one occasion yesterday by members of the SNP uh, who had an interest in that. The Right Honourable Gentleman does not seem to be interested in ensuring that we can, in a no-deal situation, provide the medicines that people in this country need. That is what we are doing. That is a sensible approach of a government that is taking this matter seriously. Jeremy Corbyn. Maybe the Prime Minister should follow the advice of the House and take no deal off the table and negotiate seriously with the European Union. And it cannot be right, Mr Speaker, it cannot be right that a hard-pressed local council and local taxpayers are footing the bill for the incompetence of the Secretary of State for Transport and this Government. The spectacular failure of this contract is a symptom, Mr Speaker, of the utter shambles of this Government and its no-deal preparations. The Transport Secretary ignored warnings about drones and airport security, gave a £1.4 billion contract to Carillion, despite warnings over their finances. He oversaw the disastrous new rail timetables last year, rail punctuality at a 13-year low and fares at a record high. That is some achievement. And now the Transport Secretary is in charge of a major and vital aspect of Brexit planning. How on earth, how on earth, Mr Speaker, can the Prime Minister say that she has confidence in the Transport Secretary? Let me tell the Right Honourable Gentleman what the Transport Secretary is delivering. The biggest rail investment programme since the Victorian era. Spending, spending nearly £48 billion on improving our railways to deliver better journeys, 20 per cent higher on average every year than under a Labour government. That is what the Transport Secretary is delivering, commitment to transport in this country and commitment to transport across the whole of this country. Uh, but I notice, I notice that the Right Honourable Gentleman wanted to focus his questions in that way rather than answer, asking uh, more general questions in relation to Brexit. Because, of course, there are still a number of issues, there's still a number of issues on Brexit where we don't know his answers to the big questions. We don't know if he'd... It's no good, it's no good Labour members burying their heads in their hands. We don't know whether their leader, we don't know whether their leader backs the second referendum. 
We don't know whether their leader backs the deal. We don't even know whether he backs Brexit. He prefers ambiguity and playing politics to acting in the national interest. People, people used to say he was a conviction politician. Not anymore. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On Friday, I visited Tipperton High School, a great local school rated good by Ofsted. But Tipperton High School is facing many challenges. The buildings are old and stressed. There is not enough capacity for all local children to attend Tipperton High School because of a growing town and a great town. But also, poverty is higher than both the county and England's national average. The school, bu school buildings are located in a flood zone. That means that when the ex burst its bank, there is a significant risk of life. That means we really do need a new school. Fortunately, we have a site. Um, Planning Mission and Devon County Council has completed a plan. Will, the, will my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, facilitate meetings between me, the school ministers, so that we can together deliver a new school that Tiverton deserves? Can I, can I thank my hon. Friend for raising this issue with me? And obviously, the quality of school buildings is an important issue in our education system. That's why we are putting more money into it, and we're investing £23 billion on school buildings through to 2021. But he's raised the specific issue of Tiverton High School and I'm sure and I will make sure that a minister from the Department of Education will be happy to meet him and with the head teacher and the council if that is appropriate to discuss this issue. Mr. Ian Blackford. Thank you Mr Speaker. Can I congratulate so many of my colleagues who are sporting yellow today as a mark of solidarity with those from Catalonia that are on trial for the political principle of supporting self-determination. Mr Speaker Will the Prime Minister rule out bringing the meaningful vote to this House less than two weeks before the 29th of March? Mr. Right Honourable Gentlemen, he was present yesterday when I made my statement to the House and he heard the process that we will be following. There, of course, is a debate uh, that is taking place tomorrow. And then we have made clear that uh, we would bring back, if a meaningful vote has not been uh, brought back and passed by this House, we will make a statement on the 26th of February and a debate on an amendable motion on the 27th. Ian Blackford. I am afraid, Mr Speaker, that was no answer from a Prime Minister that continues to run the clock down. This is the height of arrogance from a government set on running the clock down. Just 44 days from a no-deal scenario, the Prime Minister is hung-strung by her own party and rejected by European leaders. The Prime Minister must stop playing fast and loose. Businesses are begging for certainty. The economy is already suffering. Prime Minister, you have come to the end of the road, rumbled by your own loose-lipped senior Brexit adviser. Will the Prime Minister now face down the extremists in her own party yeah. and extend yeah. Article 50. Yeah. 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 Right hon. Gentleman, he talks about certainty for business. He can give business certainty by voting for the deal. That's what gives business certainty. He complains, he complains about no deal. But of course it was the SNP who wanted to leave the UK without a plan. And <laughs> Should, perhaps we should remind the SNP that independence would have meant leaving the EU with no deal. Nigel Evans. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I'll be chairing a delegated legislation while the tributes to David Nasler are paid. So, could I publicly uh, wish him well on his retirement and thank him for all the support he gave to me, particularly when I was Deputy Speaker? Thank you, David. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, Sladeburn Health Centre uh, serves 1,100 people in the village and surrounding rural areas. Um, it is well used and well loved by an ageing population with no bus service, and the contract is up for renewal, and people really do fear the salami slicing of services or, even worse, the closure. So will the Prime Minister publicly give her support to health services like Sladeburn today and to say that uh, either reduction of services or indeed even worse closure would be totally unacceptable. Can I say to my right honourable friend, first of all, 
I'm, I'm aware of the issues uh, with slave and country practice. And of course, we're aware of the pressures facing GPs. That's why uh, there's going to be a major new investment in primary and community health care. This is a very important element of our National Health Service, uh, and that has been set out in the long term plan. In the event of a practice closure, of course, what NS NHS England does is assesses the need for a replacement provider before dispersing the list of, uh, of uh, uh, patients who are on, at that GP surgery. I understand, in relation to Slaveburn Health Centre, that discussions are ongoing in relation to the future of the practice, and the local CCG are currently exploring options. Evans. I'm sure the Prime Minister welcomes the news that Instagram has pledged to crack down on images of suicide and self-harm. However, there are growing online communities which glamorise, encourage and normalise eating disorders, preying on vulnerable people who are going through extremely personal and private battles. Will she agree to meet with me, other organisations and charities to discuss ways in which we can combat this? Yeah. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for raising the action that the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport is taking in relation to, to this issue of social media sites and indeed the uh, action that the Home Office is taking in conjunction with uh, DCMS on this issue. We do want to see social media companies doing more to uh, ensure that they're not promoting harmful content to vulnerable people. The Honourable Gentleman has raised the specific issue of I think, eating disorders orders was in his question and the impact that that can have. Um, we do want to ensure that we're doing this in a way that, that does help to keep people safe in terms of what the sort of images that they're looking at. And I will ensure that a minister from the department meets with him to discuss this issue. Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Notwithstanding Brussels barroom chatter, will the Prime Minister uh, rule out a delay of Brexit beyond March the 29th, and will she also uh, rule out a future customs union arrangement which would prevent us doing those global trade deals which the Bank of England Governor uh, says is a potential golden age of trade. Yeah. As, as my honourable friend knows, I'd be very clear, and the government's been clear in the proposals that we've put forward for customs, that we want to enable we want to have that independent trade policy. It's specifically referenced in the political declaration, and we believe it is important. And I'm pleased to hear what the uh, Governor of the Bank of England has said today on the importance of free trade around the around the world. On the first point that my honourable friend raises, I'm grateful that he has asked me uh, that question rather than relying on what someone said to someone else as overheard by someone else uh, in, in a bar. Uh, it's very clear the government, the, government, the government's position is the same. We triggered Article 50. In fact, this House voted to trigger Article 50. Uh, that had a two-year timeline. That ends on the 29th of March. We want to leave with a deal, and that's what we're working for. Luke Pollard. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two weeks ago, I asked the Prime Minister to unblock the funding for Dawlish to give us the investment to improve that train line. Two weeks later, we still have no funding. I worry, Mr Speaker, that Brexit is causing the government to sit on announcements that need to be made, both on rail funding and the long-term basing of the Royal Marines for Plymouth. So can the Prime Minister tell the Transport Secretary to get on with it and announce the funding for Dawlish this week without any further delay? As I said to him then, the Department has been reviewing the proposals that Network Rail have put forward for an effective and resilient solution in relation to the Dawlish line, uh, and there will be an update on funding in due course. There is, of course, already the first phase of work to protect the seawall at Dawlish began in November. That is part of the £15 million wider investment to make the railway at Dawlish and Tainmouth more resilient to extreme weather. First glove. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I know from the doorstep in Corby and East Northamptonshire that local people want to see more police officers out on the beat catching criminals and deterring crime. With the additional money that she's rightly announced for policing, will she join me in calling for that to be invested in frontline presence? Yeah. Well, can I say to uh, my honourable friend that I recognise the comments he's made, obviously, from the, uh, the doorstep. I know he's an assiduous member who listens to his constituents and takes their views and brings them into this, uh, into this chamber. It is, of course, important that we have made more money available to police forces. I'm pleased to say that what we are now seeing is that the number of people joining police uh, officers joining police forces is at its highest level for 10 years. But we did make more money available to police forces, uh, £970 million over the, uh, over the next year. What I think is a sadness in this chamber is that the Labour Party voted against it. See Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What has the Prime Minister got against towns in North Wales? 
In the week following the loss of a £20 billion Hitachi contract in the region, the government she leads announced the moving of 380 Wrexham tax office jobs to Liverpool and to Cardiff city centre. Is it her view that towns across the UK should not have public sector jobs? No, it is not. And I have to say to the honourable gentleman, I have to say to the honourable gentleman on the issue that he raised about the uh, Hitachi site at, uh, uh, at Wilfa site, we did offer a package of support. We offered a package of support that no previous government had been willing to consider, of one third equity, all debt financing, and a strike price of no more than £75 per megawatt hour. Ultimately, we couldn't reach an agreement between all parties at this stage, and Hitachi decided on a commercial basis to suspend, suspend the project. But they've made clear they wish to continue discussions with the government on bringing forward new nuclear at Wilfer, and will support those discussions. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, over the last four years, the number of people who have been stopped and searched by the police has fallen by two thirds. At the same time, the number of stabbings has increased by a third. Does the Prime Minister therefore agree with me that carried out in the right way, stop and search is an effective part of the battle against knife crime? Can I say to my honourable friend, I absolutely agree that carried out in the right way, stop and search is an effective tool for our police forces. We recognise the concern there is about, the, uh, about violent crime, and obviously he's specifically raised the knife crime issue. That's why uh, the Home Secretary has published the Serious Violence Strategy. Uh, we've established a Serious Violence Task Force. But on the point about stop and search, just to reiterate, what we want the police to do is to use stop and search properly and lawfully. It is a vital and effective policing tool. What we expect them is when they use stop and search, they do it lawfully. Steve McCabe. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am sure you recall the halcyon days when the Prime Minister told a rapturous Tory conference that she put an end to rip off energy companies once and for all. Yeah. On Thursday, Ofgem relaxed her energy cap. On Monday, E.ON announced a 10 per cent price increase. And now we discover that the number of households in official fuel poverty has grown to over 2.5 million. How does she think she's doing? <laughs> <laughs> I say to the honourable gentleman that, of course, it is this government that has introduced the energy price cap. Uh, this is not something that was done by the previous Labour government. It has provided protection to 11 million households, and, I, I, and energy suppliers will no longer be able to rip off customers on poor value tariffs. It will save consumers a total of £1 billion on their bills annually. And the Citizens Advice Bureau has previously said the cap means people are paying a fairer price now and will continue to pay a fairer price even if the level of the cap rises. Robert Halfon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, since 2014, the number of children being excluded from schools has risen by 67%. Every school week, there are 4,253 children with special educational needs who have been permanently excluded or fixed. Uh, have fixed exclusions from school. This is a burning social injustice. Will my right honourable friend update the House on the progress of the Timpson review into excluded children and confirm whether or not the government will make schools accountable for the outcomes of the pupils they exclude, as our Education Select Committee recommended and the Secretary of State has suggested? Well said. Thank my, uh, my right honourable friend and the Education Select Committee for their work on this important issue. Obviously, we all recognise that good discipline in schools is essential, but we, it's all also important to ensure that any exclusion is lawful, reasonable and fair. And of course, guidance does set out that head teachers should as far as possible avoid permanently excluding any pupil with an educational health care plan and make additional efforts to provide extra support to avoid excluding those with special educational needs. Um, we do want to uh, ensure that schools play their part in supporting children who have been excluded working in collaboration with alternative providers and local authorities. My right honourable friend mentioned the Timpson review. That is still ongoing, but I can assure him that when it reports in due course, we will look very seriously and very carefully at the recommendations it provides. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, since 2013, 220 parliamentarians and 450 members of their staff have received mindfulness training here in Parliament. Our cross-party group 
has produced this report, Mindful Nation report, into the uses of uh, mindfulness in education, health, prisons and the workplace, and it's been well received by government. After Brexit negotiations have been concluded, when she might need to de-stress, <laughs> will she meet with representatives of uh, our cross-party group and senior scientists to look at what, what more can be done with mindfulness to uh, reduce human suffering and to promote human flourishing. Yeah. Well, can, I, can I thank the Honourable Gentleman for raising this important issue and also thank not just him but the Mindfulness uh, APBG for the work that they've done uh, and their recent report. And uh, Obviously he knows that mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is recommended for use by NICE uh, uh, for adults with depression, for adults with depression. But I, I, I notice the, the uh, I recognise the training that has gone into staff. I recently, well, some weeks ago, had an individual from my constituency come into my surgery to talk about mindfulness, and the member of my parliamentary staff I had with me had actually undertaken the training and was therefore able to speak about the, uh, the impact that that had had. So the commissioning of psychological therapies is a matter for NHS England, but I'll ensure that they are aware of this report. The gentleman is obviously a beneficiary of mindfulness himself. He seems a very calm and phlegmatic fellow these days, which wasn't always the case in the past. We're very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. George Freeman. Yeah. The Honours System is designed to acknowledge and celebrate great public service to our nation. Does my right honourable friend agree that when a small minority of recipients of honours, like Philip Green, bring the system of honours and business into disrepute by being found to have behaved disgracefully, letting down the vast majority in business who set the highest standards, then it's right that this party and this government should be the first to stand up for decent standards and look at beginning a process for seeing whether people who behave in that way should be stripped of their honour. Can I say to my honourable friend that obviously, as he has just said, the honours system is there to recognise exceptional service and achievement in a wide range of spheres of public life. And it's important that if the recipient of an honour brings that honour into disrepute, steps should be taken to review that honour. Now, that, of course, there is a forfeiture uh, process for that purpose. That does include an independent forfeiture committee, which gives recommendations to me for Her Majesty's approval. That is the, uh, that is the process, but it's important, I believe, that we have that, so that anybody who has been re in receipt of an honour that brings honour into a disrepute, that steps can be taken to review that. Vicky Foxcroft. Yeah. Last weekend, Mil Millwall Lionesses from my constituency played and beat Lewis FC in the fourth round of the FA Cup. <laughs> yeah. For winning, <laughs> the Lionesses received £2,000 prize money. The winners of the same round in the men's competition received £180,000. Is the Prime Minister willing to put pressure on the FA to equalise prize money for the men's and women's competition as the Lord did in 2000? Well, can I say to the Honourable Lady that uh, as the uh, uh, president of the Wargrave Girls Football Club, I'm very, uh, very uh, willing to commend uh, all those girls and females who play football. And uh, I think members across this House have been concerned to hear of the disparity in the, uh, in the uh, winnings that, were, that she has uh, raised with this House. Obviously, this is a matter for the football authorities, but I'm sure they will have heard the uh, concern that's been expressed in this House about the current position. Heidi Allen. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah. It takes courage and leadership to admit difficult things, because that's how we start to recognise the need for change. So I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions for acknowledging there has been a link between accessing universal credit and food bank usage. But it isn't, okay, it isn't the case that there has been a link. There is a link. Will the Prime Minister please urgently review the five-week wait and the benefit freeze? Both must go. Because the unpalatable truth is that our welfare safety net is no longer holding up those most vulnerable in society. It's tangling around their feet and dragging them under the water. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, my honourable friend, my honourable friend and I have discussed the uh, uh, universal credit and the rollout of universal credit in the past. As she will know, we've taken a number of measures. As we have been rolling this out slowly and carefully, we've taken a number of measures to address issues that have arisen. Uh, shortly after I became Prime Minister, we cut the taper rate so people could keep more of the money that they earned. Subsequently, we have, of course, uh, ensured that we, we, we uh, scrapped the seven-day waiting. 
Uh, we have introduced the, two de- the two-week uh, overlap in relation to those in receipt of housing benefit. Uh, and of course, we have also ensured that 100% of a full monthly payment is available to people at the start for those who, for whom that is, uh, that is necessary. So we have been taking steps and will continue to look at universal credit. But universal credit is a system that encourages people into work and makes sure that work pays, compared to a legacy system from the Labour Party that left 1.4 million people for nearly a decade trapped on benefits. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Despite her party's manifesto promise, nearly 7,000 pensioner households in my West Lancashire constituency could lose their free TV licences, often that is their only source of company. Is the Government going to keep their manifesto promise by taking back the responsibility they have outsourced to the BBC to ensure that older people keep their TV licences? The Honourable Lady, obviously I recognise the value that people across the country place on having a television, uh, and for many elderly people, obviously, the connection that that brings with the world. And that's why the free licences for the over 75s are so important. We've been clear that we want and expect the BBC to continue free licences when they take over responsibility for the concession in 2020. Can I just say, I think taxpayers rightly want to see the BBC using its substantial licence fee income in an appropriate way to ensure it delivers fully for UK audiences. Richard Graham! Mr Speaker, my constituent Ben Seaman receives employment and support allowance benefits and was awarded £20,000 after the recent court ruling on ESA underpayments. Ben has to spend a lot of this within a year in order to avoid having more than £16,000 of assets and risk losing eligibility for ESA. Clearly, this is an unintended anomaly. So would my right honourable friend encourage the Work and Pension Secretary, who I know is sympathetic to the situation, to resolve this as soon as possible through an exemption, both for Ben and for any others similarly affected? Thank you. Uh, Obviously, this is a concerning case that my hon. Friend has raised with me. I understand the DWP are aware, and I am assured that they are looking into this uh, issue, but I will ensure that my hon. Friend receives a response as soon as possible. Kyle! Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister's determination has been widely acknowledged, but the truth is she can't get her deal through unless something fundamentally changes in that deal. But there is a way she can get it through, which would also lead to uh, you can get it through unchanged, which would also help with the reconciliation of our country on the other side. It does mean following the example of the Good Friday Agreement and having confirmation of the people afterwards, but it does mean that there are fundamental benefits to that happening. Would I, I'm not asking her to pass judgment on that at the, at the dispatch box right now, but would she agree to meet with me and my, right, my oral friend, the member for Sedgefield, just to briefly talk it through and explore the possible benefits? The, the Honourable Gentleman. I think he knows my view in relation to a second referendum. I have expressed that on many times in uh, this House, and my view on that has not changed. I believe it is important that we deliver on the first referendum. But of course, we are, I and uh, colleagues are meeting members from across this House to discuss the issues that they wish to raise in relation to the Brexit matter. And so I will ensure that the Honourable Gentleman and uh, his Honourable Friend, the Member for Sedgefield, meet, if not with me, then with an appropriate Minister. Oh, Mr Speaker, with the return of the Royal Air Force tornadoes from operations for the last time, would my right honourable friend join with me in paying tribute not just to this remarkable jet, which has given 40 years of operations from uh, the Cold War through to the mountains of Afghanistan, but to the remarkable men and women who have flown and maintained her? Uh, can I say to my honourable friend, I'm very happy to join with him in paying tribute to the tornado and to the men and women who have flown and maintained the fleet over the last 40 years. He's referenced the Cold War to the mountains of Afghanistan, from the Gulf War through to operations against Daesh in Syria and Iraq. The tornado has been an integral and vital part of our AF operations. And I think, as my right honourable friend, the Defence Secretary, said last week, it's with a heavy heart but enormous pride that we bid farewell to the tornado from operations, having played that vital role in keeping Britain and the Allies safe. It will, of course, be replaced with worthy successes in the improved Typhoon and the new F-35s, which keep us as a world leader in air combat. But I am very happy to pay tribute from this dispatch box to the plane and to all those men and women who have both flown and maintained it over those 40 years. Samuel Roberts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. UK's democracy 
is defunct. Its economy and society chronically unequal. Britain is breaking. Mr Speaker, let us speak as others find us. This plain truth has not gone unnoticed. In pubs, clubs and homes, on pavements at schools and workplaces, in a Yes is More gig in Cardiff this Friday, people talk about this place and how Westminster is failing them. When will the Prime Minister lift her gaze above party interests, above Westminster interests? When will she work with others to remake this island, remake this island as three self-sufficient, thriving nations, rather than perpetuate the assumption of privilege for one? Can I say to the Honourable Lady that, that when I became Prime Minister, I was very clear that I wanted to work a country that worked for everyone. That was the entire United Kingdom. I note that in her, that in her question, she failed to recognise that Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, and we want Northern Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom. And can I also say to her that democracy is not defunct. Democracy in this country. Democracy in this country will be shown by this House recognising the vote that was taken took place in 2016, delivering on the result of the referendum and voting for a deal for us to leave the EU. In Bradley, Mr. Speaker, despite our comparative size, the UK has more government departments than even the USA, and we hear in this place all the time about the challenges of cross-departmental working. Will my right honourable friend commit to looking carefully in the spending review at opportunities to shrink the size of government and instead focus our spending on public services? Can I say to, uh, can I say to my honourable friend that I know the question of the size of government is an issue that a number of colleagues raise from time to time, but I have to, of course, put my hand up and uh, admit the role that I played in, of course, increasing the size of government by creating the Department for Exiting the European Union and the Department for International Trade. And, of course, we are employing more civil servants in order to ensure that we deliver on Brexit, something I believe is uh, uh, close to my honourable friend's heart. Brown. Mariam is just six months old. She's beautiful. She was recently diagnosed with a devastating form of muscular dystrophy. Her her brother had the same condition and died tragically young. Spinraza is a new, highly effective drug produced by Biogen, available in 23 countries, but not England. If Mariam lived in the west of Scotland and not West Ham, she'd get it. But negotiations between NICE and uh, Biogen haven't been successful, leaving Mariam and two other babies I know of as tiny pawns in an argument between price and profit. (laughs) Will the Prime Minister please intervene and tell others and Mariam from suffering an early and painful death? Obviously, the the Honourable Lady has raised the case with great passion in this House. Uh, I will ensure that a Minister from the Department of Health looks at the issue and responds to her. Giles Watling. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, the consumption of dog and cat meat goes against our British values. They are our companions. They are not food. Does my right honourable friend agree that a ban on consumption here, where astoundingly it is still legal, would put us in a leading position, sending a clear message to the rest of the world that the sickening and horrific suffering that these animals experience during slaughter should be stopped? If so, will she commit to this change, which has cross-party support, as demonstrated by amendment to the Agriculture Bill? Can I say to my honourable friend, obviously I'm aware of the amendment that he has put to the Agriculture Bill, and I thank him for raising this issue. The welfare of animals is a priority for this government. Of course, I am pleased it is illegal to sell dog and cat meat in the UK, and there are no abattoirs to li- licensed to slaughter dogs. And thankfully, there is no evidence of human consumption of dog or cat meat in the UK. And I certainly hope that other countries will join the UK in upholding the highest standards of animal welfare. Order. In wishing the Honourable Lady a very happy birthday and hoping that the House will join me in doing so, I call Rachel Reeves. Yeah. 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 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. 21 again. Um, <laughs> my constituent, Harriet, recently gave birth to her baby three months premature. When Harriet was due to return to work, her baby had only recently come out of hospital and she had to make the choice between taking additional time off work but struggling to pay the bills or to return to work but miss crucial bonding time with her baby. The Government had committed to reviewing this issue by the end of January. We are now halfway through February, so will the Prime Minister commit to take action and to extend parental leave to the parents of children who end up in neonatal? Awards. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, first of all, happy birthday to the honourable lady. Uh, we are we are reviewing this uh, this situation, and we're also looking at the circumstances, other circumstances, for example, like miscarriage, and, and what applies in those circumstances. But I'll ensure that a, respon- a written response is given to the honourable lady. Thank you. Finally, Craig McKinley, Speaker, the leader of the opposition has shown today that a little little knowledge is a very dangerous thing. He chose to speak about Seabourn and Ramsgate Port in my constituency of South. Thanet. He does not speak for South Thanet. I do. Can my right honourable friend assure me that the people of Thanet are ready and prepared to keep that port open for Brexit eventualities? Could she give a commitment to Thanet District Council to indemnify them for costs here on in? Can I say to my honourable friend that uh, no one can doubt the passion and vigour with which he speaks up for the people of his South Africa constituency. Uh, He's raised the issue of of Ramsgate Port. I am aware of the uh, the, um, interaction that's been, the discussion that has been between Thanet Council and the Department for Transport, and I believe that that continues. Obviously, I recognise the uh, significance of the possibility of of ensuring that there is capacity, suitable capacity, available to access uh, uh, Ramsgate uh, Harbour, and uh, I will ensure that the Department of Transport looks at the specific issue that he has raised. Order. 